enough, but uh, I will try and I will try not to let that affect me. So anyway, good morning. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Rufus. Thank you to Matt for organizing CSV Comp. Um, I'm very happy to be here on a nice sunny day in Berlin. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about um, shipping containers. <laughs> Good start. So why don't I... Right, cool. Oh. Okay. I'm going to be talking to you about shipping containers and uh, data packages, and I think I um, typoed my subtitle to this talk because that's actually meant to read uh, an experiment in how far you can stretch an analogy before the audience start throwing tomatoes. Um, so let's get started. Once upon a time, global trade looks a bit like this. Bags and sacks and bushels and barrels and bananas in this case, all carried from ship to shore and back by dock workers. And these dock workers, who were called Steve Dawes or Longshoremen, had a pretty tedious and a pretty dangerous job. They carried things one by one along planks, um, and it was incredibly slow. And for the companies that were shipping things around the world, it was also rather expensive. Today, of course, as we all know, it looks a bit more like this. It's containers and cranes, and uh, this is all the result of a major revolution that occurred starting around the mid-50s, um, when the intermodal shipping container, known as the ISO shipping container, was invented. And this made it possible to move goods around orders of magnitude more quickly and orders of magnitude more safely. Um, than had it ever been possible before with longshoremen and sacks. Um, and goods that can't be shipped in containers like these, goods that can't be shipped either in standardized containers or in bulk, like oil or grain, are known as break bulk cargo. And shipping break bulk cargo around the world is really, really expensive. It is many, many times more expensive than containerized shipping. So, I'm here to tell you that today, I think we are living in the era of break bulk data. We're in about 1956 or 1957, maybe the first few container ships have sailed, but by and large, we are definitely still in break bulk data land. Nearly every data set released by governments, companies, civil society organizations alike is released in its own special format or its own special variant of a standard format. And the problem with special formats is that they preclude the use of automated tools. And they require that at every stage, whenever the data is handled, humans are involved in writing data cleansing scripts, data loading scripts, data retrieval scripts. All of this before the real meat of the work, the data analysis, can happen. And even among smart, technically aware publishers, people who know what CSV stands for, people who know what ragged rows are and why they're a problem, um, the formats they publish data in still look a bit like bags and crates and boxes. So why is this a problem? Well, to return to my analogy, uh, in the world of break bulk cargo shipping, about, well, a very large proportion of the cost of shipping is associated with the points at either end of the journey where the boat is loaded and unloaded. And for a 10,000 mile break bulk journey, up to 50% of the cost of that journey can be associated with the two 10-mile trips between origin, or through the origin and destination ports. And in the world of data, this is also true. A very large fraction of our time is spent getting data into a format where we can use automated or semi-automated tools uh, on it. Data retrieval and data cleaning are by far and away the most boring parts of the job, and we often spend almost as long on that as we do on the real analysis, the stuff that we were actually trying to do in the first place. And, just to push the analogy just a tiny bit further, as in the era of the longshoremen, it still requires specialists, very often, to, to deal with the data. So, let's look at the impact that containerization had on global shipping. And, uh, of course, this is CSV comp, so in a format that you will all understand. Um, the impact of this is, this is what I told James earlier, should so clearly have been a bar chart, but I just couldn't resist. Um, the impact of containerization was immediate. In 1956, one of the very first container ships to sail was the steamship Ideal X. It had 58 containers on it, and uh, the, the, the firm that was responsible for that ship, the firm that owned that ship and, and controlled that sailing, 
calculated the cost of loading that ship at 16 cents per ton, which, compared with the standard cost of loading a medium-sized brick bulk ship, ship of the time of 5 bucks 86, is something like a factor of 40 productivity improvement instantly. And if we look over a slightly longer time scale, between 1959 and 1976, according to one analysis, the average time that a cargo ship spent in port had decreased from 500-something hours, which is about three weeks, to about 18 hours. And over the same period, the number of tons loaded per man hour had gone from about a half a ton to over 4,000 tons. So we're talking now about a factor of six or 7,000 productivity improvement, which is very nearly a, a four order of magnitude improvement, which is, well, not to be sniffed at. Um, and I apologize for the, for the, for the slightly strange uh, segue here, but I like to think of packaging formats as being a little bit like pensions or maybe government websites, by which I mean they're really boring, but they're also really important. Because if you don't have a pension, and nobody in your country has a pension, things are going to go wrong. So packaging formats are not terribly exciting, they're not very interesting, but they are really important. And it is, you know, all of the, all of the ethics of uh, global trade aside and globalization aside, it is unquestionably true that this big metal box completely revolutionized the way we send things around the world. So, um, you might ask, what was it about containers that made them so successful? And certainly if we're interested in, in what we're going to be doing with data, we might want to look at the design features of the container and work out whether there are, uh, whether this analogy is actually worthwhile and whether there are things that we can apply. And I, I would argue that there are. And I would say that the three really important things about the container are, first of all, its simplicity. A container is a steel box of some specified dimensions with some specified sized holes at the corners. Other than the doors, it has no moving parts. Any engineering firm in the world can make an ISO compatible container. And this is a really big deal. Second, they're opaque. Because if they were made of glass, it really wouldn't. No. Um, the point is that the people who make container frames, the people who make the handling equipment, don't need to know anything about bananas or cars or laptop computers. They just know about the size of the box and where the holes are. And last but not least, and perhaps a little bit more complicated, um, containers have what I have decided to call moderated diversity. While the important features of containers remain largely the same, the ISO standards recognize that there is not one container for all possible applications. And externally, containers come in a range of different sizes, for different amounts of stuff. And internally, there are a number of substandards for shipping different kinds of goods, liquids, dry goods, pallets, refrigerated goods. So if we want to make a successful data package format, Starting with these properties as design goals, I think it's probably not a bad idea. So history lesson over for a moment, I'm going to tell you about a container for data that aims to do for uh, data processing what the ISO container did for shipping. And it looks like this. Okay, it's not very exciting, but this is a minimal data package. It is a file called datapackage.json, and it contains a JSON object and it contains precisely one field, name. The Rufus will know where I'm going with this. <laughs> this is the standard data set that we use for everything. Um, <laughs> and you might look at this and you might think, well, this is functionally useless. What, is, what on earth is the point of a thing that doesn't tell me anything whatsoever? Now, of course, we're never going to use a data package like this. But I want to make the point that this is functionally useless in exactly the same way. An empty container is of use, no, no use to man or beast, but it is a standardized format, datapackage.json is a JSON file, and it is called datapackage.json. And that buys us something already, just as the standardized dimensions of the container buy us something. But in the interests of actually explaining what I'm talking about, here is a more likely looking data package. Um, and you can see here that it tells us a number of things about the data package. Um, it has a unique name, it has a title, which is a human readable description. We have some information about how the data is licensed. And we also have, most importantly of all, a list of resources. Um, and these resources are the actual data that we're talking about. And I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of this in detail.
detail because you can certainly you can go and look at the specifications for stuff later. But just to you know, just to, to make the point that this is a very very simple format. It has just an, a small number of fields, and the format of some of these fields is defined for you by the specification, the base package specification. So, for example, the license field that I've used here isn't a free text. It requires that the license that you specify is uh, an open license identifier, which is a separate project and standardized elsewhere. Um, sources are defined, um, uh, and there's a list of those. Resources are partially defined, and this is very important because the substandards that I'll talk about in a minute go on to explain what they're about. And the version is defined. So, if you want to release new versions of a data package, you release them in a Semver semantic version and compatible version scheme, just as the rest of the JavaScript world at the moment. And of course, the really important part is the data client, which lives alongside, in this case, alongside the data package object. But data packages can also reference external clients. Okay. And in particular, what I've shown you here is an example of a tabular data package. And a tabular data package is a, if you like, a sub type of a data package. It's a data package with some additional constraints. And in that way, it's a bit like one of these bad boys. Anybody tell me what this is? No? A blue container. <laughs> close, <laughs> close. I think you need to brush up on your container spotting skills, Jenny. This is the Rolls Royce of shipping containers. 45 foot long, 8 foot wide, and 9 foot 6 high. This is, wait for it, it's exciting. This is a 45 foot high cube pallet wide. <laughs> which means that you can put two Euro pallets in it side by side, which is really exciting if you're into containers. Um, but the point here is that it is a standardized container with some additional constraints. And in just the same way, a tabular data package is the Rolls Royce of data packages. Well, maybe not, but it's, you know, it's at least a nice, it's a Mercedes CLK or something, whatever. Um, and the requirements of the tabular data package are also relatively slight. It must have at least one data file. Um, which is or a resource, and the format of that resource must be CSV, and the schema for that CSV must be specified in the data package object, and the resource schema is specified using a separate substandard called JSON table schema. Just as in the case of this guy here, the specifications for the Euro palette are separately managed to the specifications to this guy. I admit the analogy really is a bit tenuous, but hey, I'm running with it. And uh, what's the point? Well, just as with containerized shipping, the point is to make it possible to build standardized handling equipment that makes dealing with data easier. And some people have already started building this stuff. So data package as a specification already has a number of tools and libraries out there that allow you to use it. So there are kind of the low-level handling tools, the container cranes, if you will. Um, uh, the data package manager is uh, uh, an open knowledge project, and it's, um, it's an attempt to build kind of a, a, an NPM know your, your JavaScript well um, for data packages. There are libraries for Python. Um, there's a library for Ruby written by our friends at the ODI. There is a library for the R statistical analysis package. And then there are also some slightly higher level tools which allow you to do things with data packages. So uh, one of those is uh, aimed at people who maybe know that they want to publish something as a data package but don't really want to get into all of the nitty gritty of the specification, even if they know that they can describe their data. And that is the um, Open Knowledge Data Packager, which um, I might be able to show you. I might not. It depends. I'm probably not going to. But it lives at datapackager.okfm.org. And if you have some CSVs and you want to publish them as a data package, they can help you do that. If you have a data package with some <coughs> CSVs and you want to make sure that it's actually a valid data package and the CSVs in it are valid, then you can use CSV then, also written by our friends at the Open Data Institute. And if you have a data package living in a Git repository somewhere, and you want to expose it in a slightly more user-friendly way, you can use a Git data package viewer. And last but not least, um, you will hear more later today if you go to Anna and Sarah's talk about Data Central, which is um, a, uh, if you like, a data portal for people who don't quite want to deploy CPAN yet. Um, you have a list of data packages, and you can generate yourself a nice static website from that. Okay. And this map lab, you know, even recently someone's written a map lab one. Wow, is there a map? I didn't see this. A map lab one is just one week ago. So we have KPAG Lloyd, Mask, you know, they're all they're all up and coming. Okay. Um sorry, I just bombed. I just bombed. <laughs> that was a shipping joke, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right.
Right, so by now I hope I've convinced you that um, data packages are the bomb and you're all wondering what you need to do. Well, the first thing to say is that the standards I'm talking about, data package, tabular data package, JSON table schema, are all community authored standards. And um, they are, as Jenny mentioned in her talk just now, they are informal community standards and you are encouraged to contribute to them. They live at dataprotocols.org. They are written in a Git repository. So please go read the standards, edit the standards, improve the standards. Um, they're not perfect and you can have them. Uh, you can also find dozens of example data sets all published, nearly all published, I think, in um, data package format at github.com slash data sets. And there's all kinds of stuff there. There's uh, all kinds of uh, economic data, there's uh, geographical data on country boundaries published uh, in sort of geojson and top adjacent formats, and there are data sets on browser statistics and gold prices and other things. Um, but most importantly of all, put it in a box. If you're publishing your own data, publish it as a data package. Release your own data as data packages for others, other people to use so that we get the same advantages as the containerized shipping industry got over the break bulk shipping industry. Standardized packaging formats have the ability to drastically simplify the process of dealing with data, so let's get on it. I will leave you with just one last thought, which is that I'm a bit worried that readers can tell what's coming already. Not all shipping is containerized. Oil tankers do not have containers on. So by analogy, there are situations in which data packages will not be the right answer to your problem. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> I'm done. I think we probably have time for some questions. Yeah, time for some questions. Just quickly, it's going to be tight. We've got five minutes of questions, so we go just. I'm gonna. I get to the minutes. Just gonna move back. How does this tie in with the Jenny's talk earlier about the W three C standard? So I think. Um, I think directly, Rufus is involved with the, the data package, Rufus is also involved with some of the standardization in the W3C. I think I would say that probably the most important thing that the data package that these, these community specifications want to do is kind of experiment with what is possible and see what people like and what they don't and what works and what doesn't. Um, the W3C process is fairly heavyweight and fairly slow. It is not going to be particularly iterative or responsive. It is something that is going to, well, I'm sorry, responsive is not the word I meant to use. It's not, it's not, I've been involved with some W3 standardization. It's not something that allows you to jump up one morning and go, oh, I have a great idea, don't you all like it? And people can respond to it. Yeah. It, is, it is something that will take the learnings from this community and integrate them into the specifications that they publish so that larger entities who like the W3 stamp can, can put their name on it as well. One of the ways I see it a little bit is just like an answer. One is I think that the WTC process will no, this this is iterating. I see it's like RFC, the data protocol stuff, the request for comments, it's still getting approved. And W2C over the period of doing it, I'm privileged to work with Jenny on this. We'll, we'll kind of get something which is, you know, we'll go through recommendations and come back. Um, the other thing is like HTML. Like HTML is W standard, but boy, people have added, you know, add in HTML5, one day we're going to get that spec out there. But, you know, there's been a lot of stuff along the way. So I think it's great to have something on the side that's going to keep looping fairly fast and that will keep, I imagine there's going to be iterations so I think that's, that's the analogy. So like, they're tiny couple of frames. They, I mean, you know, there's going to be some stuff changes which may come back down the street from stuff I've been talking to Jenny and similarly, we'd be building directly on it. This gentleman and then you guys talk to the last one. Come and go. Okay, this gentleman and then you two. Oh, sorry. Um, I didn't have my hand up. Oh, you didn't? Okay, oh, sorry. Sorry, I thought that was like, like accidentally at the auction, you suddenly bought me. <laughs> 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 yeah, man, man. Yeah, actually, I'm going to go on. Thank you. I'm going to go on. Congratulations, sir. I'm going to go on. I really want to talk to you, but not in here. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Got, by the way, we will have the copy break after, so there is, you know, if you've got burning questions, John is you know, a private. But one one, 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 that's one. That's fine. Okay, three three. I'm just going to, I mean, I love the container analogy, but in any kind of scenario, we're, we're the Somalis, we're not the shipping people, right? <laughs> we're like trying to get on board the big ship here, right? <laughs> and I'm wondering why is it we collectively have decided that we're going to shun Google DSPL when it works and it has this big, big fucking ship that already uses it? So I, I, think DSPL DSPL DSPL. I think DSPL fails. I think DSPL fails. 
That's one one. No one is using DSP. Google is using DSP. Google are not using Tony other than that too. So the point of the analogy is that actually, I mean, I started using this is kind of like, yeah, yeah, everybody's talking about containerization. I'll talk about containerization too. Right. But actually, the analogy is really, really good. Well, I think it is because it's my talk, but whatever. I think it's a really good <laughs> analogy. And the point is, it is just a box. Like, that is that is it. It is simple. The SQL is not simple. That's, that's um, the it's XML, get over it. <laughs> it's not simple. It's not simple. The SQL has embedded in it all kinds well, of stuff that you right. have to implement before yeah. you can say that you pass the SQL. Yeah. And as a result, it doesn't have seen adoption. Moderated, moderated, very like whatever it says, moderated diversity is the other thing. Is that the SPL is of standards and data packages a family of standards which all tie into one another and which can co-evolve. And if one of them turns out to be duff and then all sync, but um, and so on. <laughs> just, just to add one to that also, just as a disclosure, which is you might think about why something. Just to be clear, it does basically steal. I mean, there's almost nothing novel. In the, in no, the no, no. standard, but it steals from DSPL. It's well, borrows. Great people borrow, right? Uh, it takes from Node and npm, Python setup.py. It takes from a bunch of JSON LD work. It, you know, it directly is a kind of. But I think that is the key thing of simplicity. Most existing class, the amount you have to buy into is quite large. And even fundamental points go back. The other challenge and why tools are so important is no one. Well, we asked everyone to patch your data. No one packages their stuff, whether it's in Node or code, until there's something you can do there. That's why right now, even right now, the PT, the user data package, thanks to, are you guys got a beautiful view and there's a couple of others. You know, in two seconds, you can have a beautiful view of your data on the web without having to write a line of code if you build a data package. You can send it to your friends and show up how that works. Cool. So that's, that's the question we've got. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that in the library space, there is an IT, IETF standard called Bag. <laughs> Uh, and I was just wondering if you have comments about Bagot. Ba Bagot's there primarily for, for binaries, to contain binaries, but there are tools, and so notionally you could put the data in a Bagot container. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm going to say on that, I know I'm stepping terribly as Jay here. There is an appendix <laughs> to the data process. There's an appendix to the data process which goes through most of the other specs and discusses how to arrange them, including Bagot. So, it is a really good standard. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty good. I would have, you know, go into some details about it. I think the other thing about the data package is, is the fact that it's so simple to start with is it can easily cannibalize other standards if they are the appropriate thing, right? So you can reference data files in a bag of format within the data package standard and still use all of these tools to at the very least be able to tell you what they are and what they're about, even if they can't display PB data and so on. What, any other questions? I would just try that people I know we're, we're helping you get copy break. Do people well, I'm going to tell you. Let's, let's, let's wrap up. If people want to ask me questions, I'll have to So, I've got one last call. The coffee break is downstairs or around. I just remember to be back in time. I think we're going to try and be back on schedule, which would mean.